Why is exercise neuroprotective and how can we use exercise to improve the structural and functional integrity of the human brain to protect against neurodegenerative conditions as well as improve our mental health? Keep watching and you'll see that the integration of the three key pieces of peak performance leads to full mind-body mastery. Let's get clear on this. We've gone past the stage where we're simply guessing what is happening in the human brain. Despite these advancements, brain research is still dangerously one-sided as we keep researching what is wrong with the brain rather than what is right. In this video, we'll focus on the most powerful peak performance technique that is out there and that is movement. And I'm not going to focus on any particular movement per se, but rather talk about how the human brain is designed to move and break down how the key to brain body mastery is embedded in our neural circuitry itself. Even at the very early stage of my career as a neuroscientist, I valued the importance of movement. And I understood this as the first principle of neuroscience, which is use it or lose it. As my passion for neuroscience and movement grew simultaneously, I became increasingly aware of how movement is largely responsible for the plasticity of our brain architecture. And the brain is organized in two distinct but interconnected ways. And we'll get to the second way in a moment, but let's first consider the most uh, obvious way the brain is organized, and that is how it's structurally wired. And uh, the brain doesn't exist as a 2 kg blob inside our skull, but rather is a highly organized interconnected network of neurons wired for survival. Instead of simply talking about how the brain is wired, let me just show you. What you see here is an image from a special form of medical imaging called diffusion tensor imaging, and this allows us to extract what we call white matter fibers, which is the wiring that connects different brain regions. And we can render this using this colorful image here, and it is color coded, so red in the x-axis, which is sagittal plane. And the most obvious example of that is the corpus callosum highlighted in red here. And then we have green in the y-axis, which is traveling front to back in the coronal plane. And the most ex uh, obvious example of this is association fibers, which is widely distributed throughout the brain, connecting various regions such as the frontal lobe to the occipital lobe and parietal lobe. And then we have the blue fibers, which right at the top of the brain you can see over here. And these are projection fibers that are traveling transversely or from top to bottom. And uh, let's have a closer look at what this looks like in 3D. So when we look at just the transverse plane, we can extract the fibers that originate from there using this uh, tool over here. And this allows us to uh, extract a very particular brain region, which I'll show you right now. And this region is the sensory motor cortices. And if we look at it, a lot of the fibers are going from the top of the brain to the bottom of the brain. So the sensory motor cortices is connecting to the brain stem and then to the rest of the body. And that is uh, <laughs> a very obvious um, example because this allows us to control our motor movements and movements are what we're talking about in this video. But another thing that I wanna show you here is if we drag this down all the way to the bottom to the brainstem region, we see how prolifically the brainstem is connected to the rest of the brain. And this gives us an idea of what I mean when I say uh, the body is communicating to the brain. And when we look at the vagus nerve, 85 to 90% of the information traveling in the vagus nerve is going up into the brain. And when we look at this, we can actually see how prolif prolifically this is all connected. The structural integrity of these brain networks is not pre-established and as we age, these brain networks begin to consolidate and shapes our behavior, personality, and even what we choose to desire. In some cases, these brain networks can be repurposed. For example, when someone is visually impaired, their brain network then recalibrates to process spatial and auditory information 
where visual input is not available. And you may be asking, what does movement have to do with all of this? Movement upregulates the most widely distributed neurotrophin in the brain, which is called the brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF. And the presence of BDNF in the blood serum is associated with uh, neurogenesis, long-term neuroplasticity, and even the activation of pro-survival genes. So BDNF quite literally wires your brain for peak performance. If you have been following the Build Your Brain series so far, you'll see that there is a strong focus on lasting well-being and longevity. And there is no better way of doing this than movement. Put simply, if you don't keep moving, one day you won't be able to. And this is simply the use it or lose it principle. I've linked the previous parts of the Build Your Brain series in the show notes below, so be sure to check these out. Now let's have a look at the second way that the brain is organized, which is functionally. And I simply understood this second principle as neurons that fire together, wire together. And we can use a different MRI technique to measure this, and this is called functional MRI. And using this technique, we can see how different parts of the brain lights up as the signal cascade alters the blood flow to different parts of the brain. And understanding how blood flow influences brain function is the missing link that we'll explore in the final piece of this puzzle. Even though that the brain is connected structurally, not all brain networks fire at once, and this dispels the myth that we only use 10% of our brain. The brain cannot afford using only 10% because it is the most expensive organ in the body. Even at rest, the brain uses 20% of your metabolic energy even though it only weighs 2% of your body mass. This is 10 times more than any other organ. So to optimize for cost efficiency, the brain only fires certain networks at any given moment and brain networks that fire together are said to be functionally connected. If you have dipped your toe into the oversaturated world of peak performance, you would have come across flow state or the theory of transient hypofrontality. And these theories are quite heavy heavy and psychology based and only scratch the surface of what mind-body mastery is. For the purpose of this video, I really wanted to dive deep into the brain-body connection and so we'll focus on two functional networks and this is the default mode network and the interceptive network. The default mode network refers to all the background activity and chatter that happens in the mind and I've mapped the activity of this network in this publication here. And uh, an overactive default mode network is evident in overthinking of analyzing generalized anxiety disorder or simply when you're experiencing negative or intrusive thoughts. Because the brain is optimized for cost efficiency, not all brain networks can fire at once. And when we do movement, it takes attention away from the default mode network and places it on the interceptive network that is designed to monitor our internal homeostatic balance. And you've already seen how much of the brainstem fibers goes into all areas of the brain. When we do a long-term movement practice, it strengthens this connection between brain and body because neurons that fire together wire together. And there is no better way of stimulating your vagus nerve than to have a movement practice that strengthens the connection between brain and body and heightens your vagal tone. Now let's have a look at some real world applications. And this connection between brain and body is far more powerful than what modern medicine cares to admit. And if we take mental health institutions, they do provide support, yet they speak directly to the weak and wounded part of you using a tone of apathy that is devoid of soul and meaning. And medication can help, yet uh, when we look at major mental health conditions such as depression, 30% uh, of patients are actually treatment resistant and of those who do respond to medication 50% relapse and this jumps to 70% in the second episode of depression. At best you only get a slightly better version of your former self. Is this what you're really looking for? Information has a half-life and if we keep clinging on to 
outdated information, we not only prevent the progress of brain research, but also global health and well-being. By now it's clear that the presence of BDNF promotes neuroplasticity and the structural and functional integrity of the brain. And the final piece of this puzzle rests in your heartbeat. Remember how we talked about the functional connectivity can be measured using blood flow in the brain? Well, this blood flow to the brain is the direct result of the moment-to-moment -moment changes in your own heartbeat, and we call this heart rate variability. High heart rate variability, or HRV, is uh, found in an adaptive nervous system that is responsive to change. And low HRV is actually a predictor for poor response to treatment in depression, anxiety, and chronic fatigue syndrome. So instead of calling patients treatment resistant, could it be possible that it wasn't about the medication, but rather a solid foundation wasn't set in the first place? High HRV strengthens your vagal tone this communication between the autonomic nervous system and the central nervous system or the brain and the body and is the key to mind-body mastery. When we first establish this connection, we find that the body goes through a stage of trembling, spasms and even involuntary movements and we can safely experience these episodes through trauma release exercises or somatic experiencing and this can be done with a practitioner. And there are also methods out there that uses awareness to establish an interceptive connection, such as Alexandra Technique and the Feldenkrais Method. However, I'm not here to show you some secret movement that will solve all your problems. In my view, the exercise itself is irrelevant. I'm here to help you build the best brain possible. In previous videos in the Build Your Brain series, we've seen how to use breath to heighten our HRV. And when you combine breath with movement, you have without fail the single most powerful technique for mind-body mastery. And in my Training Nervous System online course, I show you how to use breath to relax the nervous system under threat, and we do this using tactical movement, stress, and fear conditioning. In some of the exercises, we actually use a partner, and this is vital not only to enhance your tactile sensitivity, which is a large part of your interceptive network, but also to reinforce the fact that your body does not lie. And you may think that you're relaxed, but only until you get direct feedback from a partner that you actually know that you are relaxed. And you will learn that it is not only about the exercise itself, but rather the mind stepping out of the way and trusting the body to do what it knows best, which is to move. When you first do the exercises in the Training Nervous System program, you might find that the relaxation induced makes you feel tired, sleepy and even fatigued. And this is because your nervous system might not yet have experienced a true parasympathetic state. There are of course those who are incapable of functioning in a natural state of relaxation. They need at least a coffee to get started and hype and drama to keep going. The great paradox here is that this state of fight or flight has become so common that we actually glamorize busyness and in fact uh, the natural parasympathetic state feels unsafe. This is a biological lie. We all remember a time when we were growing up where we needed an escape from home. And without a secure safety net, some of us stumble on destructive coping mechanisms, such as self-medication, drugs, and alcohol, or if we are lucky, a form of movement practice. And for many kids, this is when they first discover the gateway to mental freedom through dance, martial arts, skateboarding, BMX, and other forms of rebellious movement culture. For me, it was capoeira at the age of 19. And although this art form increased my strength, flexibility, and agility, the reason I kept returning was that it allowed me to vent my emotional instability and aggression through dance, song, and self-expression. Capoeira, however, was far from a full mental health solution and I didn't know how I would cope if I were to stop. And this addiction to a physical practice has rescued many from a path of self-destruction and has created characters like Wim Hof and David Goggins. 
However, at a certain point, your practice turns on you and this constant need to push and improve becomes corrosive on the body and there's little to comfort the mind. And uh, when injuries begin to accumulate, we don't actually know what is worse, whether to stop or keep going. Like many on the path of self-discovery and mind-body mastery, I dedicated my time to different movement disciplines and after doing capoeira for eight years I did yoga for three years straight followed by five years of tactical movement training and my current movement practice involves a little bit of uh, calisthenics, tactical movement and bodybuilding. Regardless of what type of movement I do, one thing remains true and that is my body is relaxed and this just shows the strength of connection between brain and body. This does have several advantages. Firstly, you're not needlessly pushing yourself and uh, this means that you're not jacked up and training under an ADHD mode. You also recover quickly and don't get fatigued that easily because your nervous system is relaxed. And thirdly, this negates injuries because breath acts as a safety net and just shows you that you are listening to your body. And this dedication to movement isn't fueled by any form of social validation or aesthetics, but rather a long-term commitment to an intrinsic reward. The ability to move itself is the benefit. We can talk about neuroplasticity all day, but this does little to rewire the brain. And I want to leave you with the final power tip, which is the key to learning. And you may be thinking, yes, I've tried the gym, I've tried yoga, I've been on the keto trend, but nothing seems to be working. Think about how many strategies you have applied over the last 12 months and then went straight back to emotional eating and consuming comfort content. The final power tip is to surround yourself with a community that allows you to keep learning. And it's easy to lose motivation when you are constantly repeating the same routine. I personally surround myself with people who actually love to move and this constant stimulation of endorphins and BDNF allows new neural pathways to form and the high HRV actually provides high level of cognitive flexibility and adaptability and uh, most importantly it is fun. So mind-body mastery is less about self-dominance but rather the ultimate act of self-dominance is to let it all go. Learning something new is about letting go of what you already know. You can learn more about movement in my Cost of Captivity talk linked here and more about the Build Your Brain series linked here.